All right. Good day and kia ora. Um, welcome to the International Association for the Study of the Commons, or IESC, uh, our fourth annual World Commons Week event. And thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Char Charlie Schweik, a professor at the University of a Massachusetts Amherst in the USA. And I'm the current president-elect of the IESC and the co-organizer of the World Commons Week 22 event. Um, World Commons Week is a global annual event uh, celebrating and promoting commons research and practice. And this is the keynote for the IASC Oceana region. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my IASC colleague, Professor Andreas Neef, who serves in the role of the IASC Regional Coordinator for Oceana and who organized this webinar. So let me just explain how this will work. We, we've asked our invited keynote speaker, Mati Riki, to talk for about 35 or 40 minutes. I'll act as a timer um, and I'll, I'll try to signal if it feels like we're going over time. The last uh, 10 or 15 minutes will be left for question and answer. And I wanna remind people, this is a Zoom webinar. Looks a little different if you're used to Zoom. Um, there's a Q and A uh, button in the menu, and that's what that's what you'd use. Um, so both Andreas and I will be um, will be watching that, and and Andreas will be doing doing the moderation. Um, to limit to ensure the webinar works well, we've limited video to the speaker and moderator, and the audio for the attendees is muted. Um, but again, use the Q and A function. If it looks like you need a dialogue, I'll, I'll turn on the microphone. Um, it doesn't look like there's anybody on phone, so I won't talk about that. So Andreas, let me turn it over to you. And I'm having a little bandwidth problem, so I'm gonna turn my video off, but I'll be here moderating the system. So Andreas, to you. Kia ora, Charlie. Uh, enga mana, enga hau e fa, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Nau mai haere mai. E koa ana te ngākau, kua tai mai koto ki te whakanui i te kaupapa o te rā, no rera e aku rangatira, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, katoa. Ki ora tato, ko Andreas Neve toku ingoa, he ahorangi ahau i te pokapu putaiao papori ki waipapa taumata rau. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andreas Neve. I'm a professor in development studies in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Auckland. I'm also the regional coordinator of the Oceania chapter of the International Association for the Study of the Commons. And I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for this webinar on the occasion of the World Commons Week. Our speaker today is Erin Matariki Carr of Ngai Tuhoe Ngati Awa descent. Matariki was raised in Fakatane on Aotearoa, New Zealand's North Island, Te Ika Amaui, and currently lives in Taniatua, just north of Te Urewera Rainforest. She completed her studies at Victoria University of Wellington with a Bachelor of Laws Honours and Bachelor of Arts majoring in Spanish. Matariki's work experience has been in the arena of Maori legal systems, including a focus on constitutional transformation, tribal governance, and implementing Te Urewera rainforest legal personhood. Matariki is co-lead of River Aotearoa Charitable Trust and a research fellow for Associate Professor Claire Charters at the University of Auckland. Her work is focused on bridging worlds in Aotearoa, New Zealand, so we can build a society which actively enables both Te Ao Māori, the Māori world, and Te Ao Pākehā, the world of New Zealanders of European descent, to thrive. Matariki, we are very much looking forward to your keynote address. Over to you. Well, tēnā koutou, tēnā koe, Andreas, uh, tēnā koe, Charlie. Um, it's a real honour to be here with you all and to be presenting for Oceania on, uh, for IASC World Commons Week. So thank you so much for inviting me. Nā mihi nui kia kōrua. Um, koutou koutou tīma. Um, and tēnā tātou. For those that have arrived to uh, come and share in the corridor today, I really appreciate um, your, your attendance. <laughs> uh, being here with us today, I think it's wonderful to be able to share some of the stories that I have for us. 
um, right across old, uh, old, not only Aotearoa, but, but the world. So I appreciate this opportunity. And uh, nga mahi nui kia koutou i tai mai ki tēnei hui, tēnei kōrero. So ko wai tēnei, ko Erin Matariki kā tōku ingoa. My name is Erin. And on the screen, I have two pictures of two different mountains. Um, one at the top is Mount Putawaki and the other below is called Maunga Pohatu. And I put these here to represent the whenua, or the land that I, um, I come from. Um, and in the Māori world, when we introduce ourselves, we, we often start with our mountain or our waka and our rivers and um, the shared meeting places that our families belong to, that our, our whakapapa or our genealogy connects us to. So we don't really present ourselves as individuals, um, but as members of a wider collective. Um, and so that's why I have these, these two maunga here to, to show you who, who I am um, in terms of how I relate to the, to the land, the landscape that my ancestors are from. So um, I'm from Ngātiawa, which is the mountain above, and Ngātuhoi, which is the mountain below. And it will be about my side, my Ngātuhoi side that I'm sharing today. Um, this mountain here at Maunga Pōhatu is uh, stands right at the south of our rainforest, Te Uruwira, and we'll be looking at Te Uruwira as a case study uh, for some of the stories we'll be sharing today. I'm also Welsh, English and Croatian descent, so I like to acknowledge those sides of my uh, myself as well. So let's get into it. We don't have heaps of time and I'm hoping to have some questions and dialogue with you all too. Um, oh, okay. I wanted to start with this quote by uh, Pa Moana Jackson. Uh, so Moana Jackson was a really incredible legal scholar um, with a huge heart who, who was from Aotearoa, from Ngāti Kahunganu, Ngāti Pro and Rungomai Wahine. He was a lawyer and he was a teacher of um, many, many, and uh, he passed away earlier this year. Um, so one thing that he said, and this is a quote on the side here, a story really, one of our um, rangatahi, our young people, asked him, what is the biggest thing that the British Crown took away from us Māori through the process of colonisation? And he said it was belief. And what he meant is that they took away our belief and our ability to make decisions for ourselves. They took away our belief that our language and our culture was worth retaining. And they took away our belief that our systems and ways of living were good enough. So he encouraged us to let's keep believing in ourselves. And maybe just a side note, whenever you hear the word crown in New Zealand, we use the word crown to refer to the British crown or the state government. So I just realized that's not a common language thing across the world. Um, so belief, belief uh, is really and returning to our indigenous systems of governance, of making decisions, um, of our language, our culture, and our systems of living. So that'll be a theme for us. Um, commons in the law. So for me, when I think about law, and I'm trained as a lawyer in the Western system, um, I don't think about, it's really common to imagine a police car or a courtroom or a big book when you hear the word law, you know, or a judge with a horsehair wig. That, that's often what comes to mind when you hear that word law. But what I want to challenge us is actually to take a step back from that and to see that as just one expression of law, that's a Western legal system, and to actually understand law as a being about relationships. So my central question is really, how do we share space, geographic space, together peacefully over time? I think that's the major question at the heart of what law is trying to answer. And the subtext to those is, how do we relate to the earth? And how do we relate to each other? That's, those are the questions that really define what, how law interacts as a human regulation system, as a system that helps us to see ourselves and to share space over time, over generations. And um, yeah. So the fact of the matter today in this age is that we are born into a colonized reality. That's everyone. 
right around the world today. It's just a fact. We're born into a colonized reality. And that means that Western systems of law, of economics, of science, of policy, of education are so normal to us that they're invisible. And it's like being a fish in water. We do not know what water is until it's pointed out to us. And so our big challenge today, when we look at the commons, we look at the state of our earth, our climate crisis, um, multiple intersecting crises, and um, we need to recognize that we're in a battle of the imaginations, that what we have as our normal reality is actually a globalized Western European uh, concept of reality, and that other worldviews are incredibly important, especially land-based or what I call kin-centric worldviews, like indigenous worldviews, are actually essential for us to return to, not as an alternative to this normal, but as a valid system for um, decision-making and, and living and sharing space together over time. So that's a, my main challenge. And I thought because we use this word colonization a lot, and I will use it a lot because it's part of our reality, I know it can be an inflammatory term. And I'm, I'm asking everyone to just relax out of that and look at it as a factual historical occurrence. And I want to point to three mechanisms of colonization that help us see what it is that we're talking about, as opposed to it being an us and them kind of trigger that causes uh, disunity and hurt feelings and, um, and a lack of space for real dialogue. So for me, there are three mechanisms of colonization. There are definitely more, but for the sake of this presentation and simplicity. The first is known as the doctrine of discovery. Now this, I feel like is a really important thing. And if you haven't heard of the doctrine of discovery, it's a great point to Google and start reading. And it was a point in history in the 15th and 16th, um, 1600 centuries when the monarchies of Western Europe gave themselves legal, political, and theological authority to go out and conquer new lands and non-Christian people. It was known as the Doctrine of Discovery because it was a series of papal bull documents that were issued by the Pope and granting this authority, this permission to go out and do that in the name of God. The second mechanism of colonization was the actual violence that occurred when those powers landed on the shores of the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, and all through other Africa, and also all places, Philippines, um, and that I would I would like to note that as the actual violence of disconnection, because upon colonizing and dispossessing indigenous people of the of their land, they disconnected people from the land um, and from their place, from their language, from their culture, and from their ability to make decisions and do things like what Palmoana was saying. Um, and then. The next thing, uh, the, th the third mechanism is what I call curated amnesia. And some people call this the violence after the violence. And it was the strategic implementation of policy and legislation to remove the history of colonization from our education systems. So if you haven't heard of the doctrine of discovery, it's because of this curated amnesia where it was important that the population had little to no understanding of colonization, and therefore it's extremely difficult to hold actual dialogue uh, between Indigenous peoples and um, settlers about what's happened here because it's been wiped from our memory, which has also contributed to the creation of normal life and Māori viewpoints in this case being an alternative way to see the world as compared to the normal Western way to see the world. So those are the three mechanisms. Um, now this next page is to look at this normal or like fish and water to try and identify what the water is. And I wanna hone in on the Western legal system. And so, when we ask those two questions I set out at the front, whereas how do we relate to the earth and how do we relate to each other, we can start to see where the Western legal system sits. So how do we relate to the earth in a Western legal perspective? It's anthropocentric, 
because we relate to the earth as owners to property or as managers to a resource. The earth is commodified. It is an object. We can buy and sell it. Uh, we have property rights to grant access to it or deny or extract from it or dispose into it and to trade it like any other household item. You can have a title of land that you can sell and you move on. And that is really on the philosophy that humans are separate from the earth, which is, what, and there's also a hierarchy in that where humans are not only separate, but more important than the earth, which is why we can be owners, that we can assume that we can own this earth. How do we relate to each other within that context? As in a similar mindset, we're transactional in our, um, in our relationships. We are individuals. We have rights, um, like the property rights we named, and transactional in how we relate. So we're either an employer or an employee, um, a seller or a buyer, consumers, um, producers. We are in these kind of relationships that are transactional. It's very easy within a Western society to be quite anonymous because you can get all that you need without having to have genuine relationships um, if, you, if you wanted to. Like, of course, we're social animals too, but that's sort of beside the point I'm making. Okay, so that's a Western legal system. Um, disconnection, I would say. Um, this is Dr. Vine Delore Jr. And hopefully he's um, familiar to some of you out there. He's got an incredible book, which I haven't got the name of it on here, but just Google him. And he's just making that point a little bit more. So theoretically, at least, our present view of the natural world has no place for natural futures and entities themselves. They are more conceived as our property and that has no existence apart from the human legal rights that have been attached to them. So in our Western legal system, they don't have rights as such. That's changing, which we'll talk about. But typically, the earth is subject to our rights over it. And so our, um, what does he say? Yeah, nature has no rights of its own in our legal system. If our legal system reflects our view of reality, then we believe that we exist over and apart from the physical world. So that's just a quote that helps back up what I'm trying to say there. Māori legal systems, on the other hand, um, are very different. So I uh, just introduced this beautiful painting. This is by Robin Kahukiwa. And I think it captures uh, sort of what a legal system in Te Ao Māori might en en envision. So how do we relate to the earth in a Māori legal system? Instead of anthropocentric, we are kin-centric. Now, kin-centric is a word that I find really useful because the other word that we might use is ecocentric. But my problem with that word ecocentric, which is, of course, centering the earth, is that it still implies a distinction between human and earth. Kincentric, on the other hand, centers the relationship between humans and earth. <clears throat> and like in my introduction, where I introduce myself as connected to the mountains, that's a huge underlying philosophy of what we call whakapapa, or um, the concept of our genealogy right through our ancestors back to the land. So we relate to the land as a child to a mother, not as an owner to a property. In fact, our belief is because the earth was here way before any of us, and as she is more ancient than us and she gave us life, that we're of her body, that our bodies are made of the same minerals that are in the earth, it would actually be arrogant within our legal system to claim ownership of any part of her because how can the child own the mother? Um, she's been here way longer than us. We're just part of her overall living system. It seems arrogant and um, to then try and claim that we are, are greater than her to the point where we would own her and be able to manage her. Um, so there's that connection through Papa. Then how do we relate to each other within a Māori legal system? We are more relational rather than transactional, because we recognize and we prioritize our relationship through whakapapa, our kinship. Instead of having property rights, we recognize collective responsibilities of care, not only to the earth or papa tuanuku, but also to each other. And we have interdependence. 
which is I have my own independence, but my survival relies upon my society. And I need my people um, to be able to be who I am and to live a good life. Um, yeah. I guess my other point that I want to say is that these values that I'm sharing, I recognize with all peoples um, that these values of needing kinship, but within the legal systems, we have a system that doesn't actually allow us to relate to the land as an ancestor or as a mother. And so I just want to share that common feeling that most people that I talk to, no matter where they're from, actually have similar values to these. Okay, moving on. All right, cool. So now we get to just dive into a case study of how this Māori legal system might work in practice. So it's not just airy fairy, but we've got something that we can look at and pull apart. So Te Uruwera, just an introduction to Te Uruwera. So here we are in the um, North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is known as Te Ika a Māori because it looks like the great fish of Māori, who is a, a demigod in our history, who, who fished the North Island out of the ocean. Um, and Te Uruwera occupies the space uh, on the east coast or just inland from the east coast which is known as Te Manawa o Te Ika Maui or the heart of the great fish of Maui. She's a rainforest over 200,000 hectares which is very large for our little country um, and she is a virgin rainforest. She's never been deforested though she um, there have been introduced pests like uh, deer and possums and rats and stoats uh, and wild pigs that some of them we hunt for food, but their populations burgeoning, they really, really have an awful effect on the bird life. Uh, we have mostly birds in Aotearoa, mostly flightless birds actually, and, um, and on the trees. So while she's virgin forest and hasn't been deforested, or most of her hasn't been, um, she has significant pressures upon her life uh, living systems. Um, so here is a quote on screen, Te Uruwera is of Papa Tuanuku, or Mother Earth, and together with her siblings make up our nature and universe. She is the creator of all life. And that's recorded in a management plan called Te Kawa o Te Uruwera, and that is a concept, a Māori legal concept, that whole child to mother. Oh. Te Uruwera Nai Tūhoi. So I can't talk about Te Uruwera without talking about Nai Tūhoi, which is our our people, our tribe. So here's some beautiful pictures of the Nahiri. And this is the homeland or iwi whenua, motherland, um, for my people Ngai Tūhoi. Ngai Tūhoi is the name of our tribe. We're made up of lots of different sub-tribes, hapū. And we're also known as the children of the mist because we're named after our ancestress who was uh, the mist maiden. Her name was Hine Pukohurangi. And she married the mountain. Um, in, our, in our creation story. And they had Portiki, who became our eponymous ancestor. So Children of the Mist, or Nga Tamariki o Te Kohu, is our nickname, I guess, or how we're known. And you can see pictures of this mist. So this deep, dark, green, mossy, fresh forest, you can almost feel how cool, how cold she is. Okay. So something amazing happened, something that was really hard to imagine it was even possible 20 years ago. In 2014, as part of our, um, as part of our settlement with the Crown, oh, first I might say, actually, that this homeland, even though this homeland is ours, where we're from, where, our, our, where we were created, um, during colonisation, this forest became stolen over a long period of time. Um, parts of her were sold off and then the huge part of her that couldn't be deforested because of the steep um, mountains that she, that she has within her landscapes was turned into a national park. And I know that national parks tend to sound like a really good idea <laughs> because they separate off a piece of land that humans aren't allowed to touch or do anything with, but they're actually, um, very Western concept. The, the concept of wilderness is a very Western concept because what it does is detach the human from, from that piece of earth and to, to, to carve it out and say, that's nature over there. We're going to conserve her. 
Um, that doesn't fit with our worldview. We are also nature. And our relationship with the land is uh, really important. That our, as humans, we belong as part of the land and that our actions should be in accordance with the, the living systems of the land because we are that too. So the idea of conservation as well is, is um, I would say not ambitious enough <laughs> because conservation is just to say, oh, well, here's a piece that we're just gonna carve off and we're just gonna conserve it as well as we can. Um, it's, it's not, it, it remains within this concept of disconnection and it's not ambitious. I would wanna see healing as opposed to conservation. So all those pests that have introduced to her body, healing away from that, healing her, and in the process, healing ourselves and our connection with her. So stolen land. Now, go back to 2014. Uh, an act was passed that vested Te Uruwera in herself. And this is the first time in Aotearoa this has happened, and I think in the world, where a forest gained legal personality. For me, this is a really creative innovative use of a Western legal system to introduce a tuhoi perspective or a Māori perspective of the land. So here you've gone and said, okay, this area of land, this territory, now owns herself. No human owns her. She in and of herself is valuable and valid and she owns herself. Um, she's a legal person with the rights, powers, duties, and liabilities of a legal person, just like me and just like a company. So this concept isn't unfamiliar within the Western legal system. We just use it for commerce. In here as well, what's created is so you have a territory that is set out and owns herself. And then because we need to be able to communicate with the forest, a board has been appointed called Te Uruwera Board. And um, their role is to be the voice of Te Uruwera. These are black and white clips from the actual act. So up here, I just wanted to share more about the act and how it works. In section 17, it sets out the purpose of the board is to act on behalf of and in the name of Te Uruwera and to provide governance for Te Uruwera in accordance with the act and also the management plan, which we get to. Um, the function is to prepare and approve the management plan, which has been made. It's called Te Kawa o Te Uruwera, and it's really an introduction of the Tuhoi legal system. And I just wanted to point out, we won't go through this, but you can see in the second half of this page that there are functions that the board must consider to give expression to the land. And one of those functions is Tuhoi Tanga, and that is our ability to be Tuhoi. Only Tuhoi can tell you what that means. No one else can define that. Then there are two concepts of management, such as rahui, tapu me noa, mana me maori, and tohu. I won't go through those translations. They're, they're actually down the bottom. But that's giving, carving again within a Western piece of legislation, carving out space for tuhui to be able to apply our own concepts of our relationship with the land and therefore our relationship with each other. So let's take rahui as an example. It's defined there as to convey the sense of prohibition or limitation of a use for an appropriate reason. How that works in practice, just as an example for us, is that we might recognize something's happened within, say, the river. Say someone has had the tragic event and they have passed away, they've drowned in this river. We would sit down in our law, a rahui, over that place. And we would say, we need to set this place aside and say, we do not go, we do not gather food from that space. Something big has happened there. And we're going to set it aside for a time until we feel like it's the right time to go back to it. And so that's relating to the land and recognizing the happening, then relating to each other and saying, okay, this is the choice. This is what the land requires. We need to just keep away from the space for now. So that's one example of a mechanism within two-boy law. This slide with lots of words, I apologize for that, but lots to share, um, is an introduction to Te Kawa o Te Uruwera. Now, as I said, that's the management plan. And so now we'll just go through this slowly. We have this territory of the forest that owns itself. We have a board appointed to be the voice of the forest, which has six tuhoi and three uh, crown or government appointees. 
And then they created what's known as the management plan or te kawa or te uruira. Now, usually a, a Western management plan would be all about resource management. But we don't like that idea because for us, the earth is living and ancient and enduring and our ancestor. So to demote her to a resource is arrogant and wrong. And to consider us as her managers ignores the fact that we know very, very little about her living systems. And so how could we assume this role of managing them? Um, she knows how to make butterflies, you know, the earth, she knows how the mist relates to the treetops, relates to the birds, relates to the stream. Her living systems are constantly in communion with each other. Us humans, we don't really get to understand all of that. Our intimacy with the land, especially now uh, during a colonized era, has been disrupted so much that we can't see those. So to be able to claim that we're skilled enough to manage those is a falsehood, it's a, it's a fiction. So instead of resource management, what Tikawa asks us is to manage people for the benefit of the land. It's human management for the benefit of the land. And what that recognizes is that humans are the ones placing pressure on the earth. We're the ones that need management, not her. She knows what she's doing. We need management. So it's really that simple. Um, these are, I won't read out anything else on this, but this is available online if you'd like to read it. It doesn't read like any other management plan you might, you might be used to. It's really um, quite poetic in how it shares almost a constitutional position of how humans need to come back into relationship with the land and through that with each other, how to lose our individualism and regain our collectivism and connection with the land. Oh, pie. Awesome. So this management plan has been in place since 2017. It took about three years for the board to develop it and for it to be accepted. And then there have been some implementation of, of different things that I wanted to share with you. So one example um, is usually with in the D Department of Conservation, the Western Conservation Management Technique. If you wanted to visit a national park and you wanted to take a tour group, and so you would be earning money, you have a commercial relationship, you would just need to pay a fee to the authority and receive a license, and then you could go and you could make money by virtue of visiting that space. And so here you are benefiting commercially from that beautiful space that you get to visit, and the only reciprocity that you offer is a fee to an authority, another human. There's no reciprocity in that to the land, not usually and not enforceably. <laughs> so instead of having this concession um, relationship, which is transactional, we have a reciprocal concentric relationship, where we, which we call friendship agreements. So you would say, okay, if I wanted to bring my tour group to Te Uruira now, I would need to have a friendship agreement that the board helped me achieve. And people are going, well, what does that mean? And the board says, well, you have friends, don't you? <laughs> what does it mean to be a friend? So if you could be a friend to a forest, it means that you have a mutual interest in the well-being of your friend, that you hope that anything that you gain, your friend also gains. And so instead of paying a fee for access and benefiting yourself, you would look at the place that you're accessing and you would say, well, what can I do here with my operation that will be beneficial? So a simple example might be, well, my tour group comes and we're going to clear the tracks or we're going to um, uh, take out some pests or we'll set traps or we'll um, pick up rubbish, you know, that that is a enforceable, that's a major part of your activity within the forest because you want to care for your friend, the vast forest, and build intimacy with her, reciprocate, relational, not transactional. Another example was a, quite a controversial one at the time, and it's called The Road to Nature. And these things you can actually Google too if you're interested. Um, and essentially there's one road that goes through the body of Te Uruweta, and it's a gravel road and it has potholes and it has corrugation. And so the government at the time wanted us to tar seal it. But of course tar seal is made out of bitumen, which is a fossil fuel extract, which is uh, denigrating to the earth. It doesn't help her, it takes from her and it's, it's not good for her health. 
So we saw that it would be hypocritical of us to use bitumen, a fossil fuel, to um, carve, you know, to lay upon her body when we're also trying to be in reciprocity with her and uplift her mana, just as we uplift our own. And for our convenience, that road is only there for human use. She doesn't need it. So that would be a totally anthropocentric thing to do. It's all about us. Instead, Tuhoi TUT, um, our governance entity that exists today, created, uh, looked into um, this product called Tall Oil Pitch, which is a resin made out of pine residue that you can use. They've created a nice recipe um, with Opus Engineering and they've invested into it and they've done trials of this where it's a resin that you lay upon the road and then you put gravel on top of it. It still looks like a gravel road, but it saves from the uh, corrugation and it saves from the potholes. It requires more upkeep, so more work, it's a bit more cost, but it's not just you know, taking from the land without giving back. And so our priority isn't the cost or the convenience, it's making sure that we can reciprocate with the whenua, with the land, and that we're not being um, hypocritical in our aspirations for how we relate to her. Um, the last two examples, just quickly, living buildings and eco-villages. Any uh, construction effort is very, very taxing on the land because we use all sorts of products like glues, um, we import lots of products. There's lots of waste, construction waste and normal construction. And so the work that Tuhoi has done, any buildings that they have created have been in line with the living building challenge, which again is just our way to mitigate the human impact on the land for the benefit of the land. It's all about reconnection, which is why I have reconnection of humans to land. We're not separate. We are together her interests, speaking on behalf of her, acting on behalf of her, and also being able to do what we need to for us humans is where we want to be. We want to be connected with the living systems of, of Te Uruwera and of Papa Tuanuku, of all of Mother Earth, you know? Um, and this quote is also from the management plan. Nature is our mother, respect for one's parent is the highest duty of life because without her, we have no purpose together. If we don't have our Papa Tuanuku, then... We're not here. Um, this is one final painting. <laughs> I love this painting. This shares a little bit about our culture too. And I think this is actually the heart of what Papa Moana Jackson shared about our belief in ourselves, um, that we must love ourselves again. We have to fall back in love with ourselves and our connection with the earth. So me ata whakarungo ki tō tātou manawa e kapa kapana. That means we must listen carefully to our own hearts that beat within us. So we are nature. We are part of this living system. We need to fall back in love with that. We need to stop being so disconnected and extractive. And we need to remember who we actually are and, and reconnect with that in our legal systems and in our practices and our lives. Um, so mauri ura kia tato. Um, that's the end of my and I really welcome any questions. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Tēnā koe, Erin. Matariki. Really enjoyed your engaging and inspiring talk. Thank you very much. And uh, we have two questions already in the Q&A uh, box. Um, I can just read the uh, first one to you, Erin. Um, and while the others might be typing their, their own questions, please engage uh, as much as possible and take the opportunity to ask questions to Matariki. Uh, Shan Turnbull asks if uh, you would accept the term ONI to describe the Maori relationship to land rather than owner. ONI. Yes, well, if we're going to use that concept of ownership, I think the land owns us more than we could ever own the land. So I've never heard the word oni before, but I think it does marry up with what we're, what we're saying. I would typically use the word children or descendants of the land, though. Yeah. Thank you for well, the question. Uh, the other one is a very easy one to, to answer, probably. How many different languages are used by Maori, also from Shan Turnbull? Ah, um, so we have one language, uh, Te Reo Māori, the Māori language, but we have multiple dialects. 
So while Māori is a word that we use to describe the Indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, we, we didn't identify as Māori unified until the British Crown came and we had settlers arriving. Before that, I was Tuhoi or Ngātiawa, or I was even a smaller sub-tribe of the bigger tribe. So um, there are dialectical differences just like there are cultural differences within Māori dim or te ao Māori, the Māori world. Yeah. Kia ora. Um, there's a question from Mary Ann Perot. Um, she asks uh, whether there's other initiatives uh, from the Crown or the state to create new identity like um, Te Orevera on the land. Yes, um, we have a river, the Whananui River, who also has legal personhood, and that's awesome. Um, the difference with a river as compared with a forest is that the river has a starting point and travels and is constantly changing and travels through different territories to the ocean. And so it's harder with the river to have one voice like we do with the forest with the Tuhoi voice, um, but the river also has legal personhood. And I think it's quite an exciting use of, and an innovative use of a Western legal system to carve out space for a Māori legal system to ex be exercised, yeah. Can I um, Mary Gunn asks, um, do you ever use the word commons in a Maori concept or is there a better theory or Maori word to use? Uh, I don't know. I don't often read the word commons within the works that I use, but I think it's a useful term in, in English to develop you know, what we discuss with Māori terms like Papa Tuanuku or Fenua. So the word Fenua just means land. It also means just to share, but it also means placenta. Um, and so when you think of the baby growing inside the mother, the placenta that feeds that baby is called Fenua, just like the land that feeds us in this world is called Fenua. So the concept is just the same. Um, so commons. Well, I guess. The other thought is that we didn't have the concept of ownership. So the idea of titles or private land wasn't, didn't exist. Um, there were territories, but all of it would have been common. So it was almost just land rather than here's my private property and here's the commons. Um, yeah, but today we would probably use it more, but it wasn't, it's not a traditional concept within our worldview. Yeah. Um, another question from Shan. Um, might Erin describe the governing framework of the Maori? Maybe in comparison to indigenous Australian frameworks as well. Wonderful. Yeah, well, um, the governing framework of Maori is concentric again. So it's based on um, whakapapa or genealogy. And uh, it really begins with um, the individual is part of a whānau or a family. Then multiple families become the hapu or a sub-tribe. And actually just these words, just so you get a feeling for what this Māori worldview, whānau means family and it also means birth. Hapu, the sub-tribe, the collection of families that live within a space, um, means sub-tribe, hapu, and pregnancy. So the hapu which um, visually, if you picture a marae uh, and every marae, which is a gathering place um, for Māori to come to and used to be the centre of our villages, um, belongs to usually one hapu. So there's a space, it's like a village, I guess. And because hapu means pregnant as well as sub-tribe, pregnant, you can think of it as being swelling with life this was the daily reality for our, our society. And because it was swelling with life, it was where life altering decisions were made. So the major governance uh, decision making on a daily effort was, was within that hapu structure. Bigger than that, so many hapu within a region would connect through to an eponymous ancestor and that would be known as iwi, which means tribe, but iwi also means bones, uh, koiwi. So you can see how the human body and process of life is also connected to 
how we govern ourselves and how we connect to the earth. Iwi would come together, all, all these hapu would come together as iwi to band together when they needed to for an, uh, uh, interest topics of, of mutual concern. And we would have a shared identity. So if there was, say, a war, iwi would usually gather together and go to war against another. Um, so within our modern governance, that's our traditional governance system, our modern governance systems are trying to echo that, but within a modern world. And so you're trying to make sure that decision-making isn't held at, at iwi and held in a hierarchical manner, but actually dis discussed and deliberated by hapu, by families at hapu level, and then decisions might be made more collectively at an iwi level, but informed by what's happening down there. So that's our... Our hope and our dream is to be able to do that within a modern context. Yeah, I hope that helps. It's quite a lot in that. Thank <laughs> you. Um, there are two more questions. Uh, Marianne um, asks whether, um, or, uh, she's wondering how your community and Te Orevera earned its status, whether there were any political representations uh, at higher level. And I think it goes along with that question by Helen Ross, who also asked, how did your people embark on obtaining Western recognized legal personhood for Tea Urevera? Mm -hmm. And um, she adds where the question, where can others start? Ah, oh, well, thank you for those questions. Um, so I think, yeah, to understand with our specific example, Te Urevera, that was part of a, a treaty settlement process. Um, so I like to think of our timeline. So from time immemorial right up until the 1800s, um, that whenua, that land was ours. We were part of it. That's We exercised authority and sovereignty over it. Then in 1840, the British crown came. Uh, well, it was here earlier, but 1840 is an important date. Um, and colonization began. So that's what, 180 years-ish. Um, so for all of time immemorial, we had mana motuhake or independence here. And then for this tiny segment of time, we lost all control over our land and authority and decision-making, we were disconnected. The treaty settlement process is based on trying to reconcile some of that loss. And it, it works right across our country. Every hapu or iwi um, have a chance to settle with the crown. And within the two hui negotiations, we had quite a unique position because the rainforest remains a rainforest, which is one big body. Um, and our negotiation, we basically entered into negotiations with the uh, Crown. And we said that we want the forest, but that was our bottom line. Um, originally, the idea was to just return ownership to two hui, but that doesn't fit with our concept. And so the idea of legal personhood was born and, and, well, not born, but was shared as an option and it was agreed to. Um, so it was part of a broader process, the treaty settlement process, which I'm happy to talk to in more detail. Um, we're coming towards the end of that process. It started in, well, it started in 1975, but more really in 1985. So it's been um, over 30 years in the making and we settled in 2014. So that's when she came back. Um, in terms of how where to start for yourselves, because that's quite a unique process to Aotearoa, I would start, start looking at legal personhood as a valid option for seeing the land. So for moving on from this idea of ownership, which is very, very Western, into legal personhood, and then developing policies of how to relate in that way, how to allow the land to be valid in and of herself, and to develop policies that enable that. So it um, takes creativity, but it makes sense. I think we're all land-based peoples. All our bodies come from the land. So uh, yeah, hope that helps. Can I quit? Uh, Rodka Medlage, I um, hope I pronounced that correctly. He asks, how are decisions made, I guess, in your iwi, whose voices are heard, who decides within the family, within the tribe? Um, Thanks for that question too. So decisions are made. So the board, of course, makes the final decisions. Um, the people that are, how they're appointed to the board um, really looks at the tūhoi governance structure. So just in short, 
Tuhoi is made up of what we'll say four valleys. And each valley has what we call a tribal office. And those tribal officers get to appoint one representative each to the board. Then there's an iwi office that kind of does all the administration, I suppose, for the whole iwi. And they appoint two members to the board. And then the Crown, the British the government, gets to appoint three members to the board. Um, so the authority there must be their representatives um, from across Tuhoi, and the majority are Tuhoi, and the chairperson must always be Tuhoi, and then the Crown. So they have a lot of deliberations there, but they must listen to those that appointed them, which are the tribals and the office, as well as the Crown. Um, and that means, so what we have is every month, there are meetings within those tribals and families and hapu, um, hapu are represented there and families are welcome to attend. And that's where discussions happen on the ground and then anything that might be relevant at that time go up to this board and forms the board and then the decisions are made by the board. That's how I'd probably describe it. Very collective. There aren't individual votes, not usually. They're collective votes. And that's, again, a way for us to reconnect to our way of relating to each other instead of being individuals with individual rights. And, you know, the whole concept, we are what we do, you know. So every practice that we can instill collectivity into, we will practice because that reconnects us to ourselves as collective people and to the land. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Rama, sorry, Keith. Um, there's a question uh, from Jim Sinner. Um, he asks, what work are you doing now to build on and extend these concepts? That's such a great question. Thank you. Thanks for all the questions, actually. Um, the work now, I would say, is our social fabric of our tribe. And the communication between the tribe and the rest of Aotearoa, be they Māori or um, Pākehā or um, settler of descent. Um, so we have this legal infrastructure in place and decisions are being made like the friendship agreements or the road to nature, and that's fine. But we now have to, in ourselves, as, as humans, almost it's sort of like decolonizing ourselves, or I prefer to call it reconnecting, because for me, decolonizing, that word decolonization centers colonization too much in the psyche and I'd, I'd prefer all of our energy to be looking at reconnection as 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 the other side of the coin and so the work now is we have the legal infrastructure and now as a people we need to mount back towards the land and our practices we are a colonized people that's our reality. It's true for all Indigenous folks. It's true for all people, actually. Europe was also colonised just so long ago um, that it's not as living in the memory as Indigenous peoples today. And that's why I say it's so exciting for all people that Indigenous peoples and Indigenous legal systems are coming up to the fore because they are ancient land-based legal systems that were real for all people. It's not really an us and them reality. So yeah, our work today is really uh, coming together, remembering how to be together as a group and not individuals within our own nuclear families and houses um, and practice collectivity and practice connection with the land and things like, um, you know, our individual decisions or our family decisions. Do we drink out of plastic water bottles? You know, things like that, where we talked about the hypocrisy with the bitumen on the road and the land. What about our own decisions? How do we reconnect ourselves? What gardens are we growing? Um, how do we protect from food sovereignty? Um, how do we make sure that our decisions are also, yeah, assisting the land? Oh, people joining us. Sorry, I can see there's more questions, so I'll leave that one there. Thank you. I'm actually trying to promote the attendees to be panelists so you can see who you're talking to. Thank um, you, Charlie. I, I'm trying to do that, but I'm having a little bit of a hard time. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll keep trying, but we're, we're starting to get toward the end of our time, but um, such a great conversation. I, uh, Matakari, I, I don't know if you're okay to stay a few minutes longer. I'm fine. No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you.
Um, I don't know if I can make this work. I'm trying. <laughs> In the I meantime, just I just say... read one comment from Anne Poelina, who was actually our keynote speaker two years ago. Um, and nice to to have you. Um, she makes the comment, we have learned a lot from the experiences of Maori with, with the mountain and the river. In Australia, we're creating an emergence of legal pluralism towards ancestral personhood. This is because, because the river and the mountain are, are, are our ancestors. Um, thank you so much, Professor Anne Polina. Um, you're an inspiration to us as well, especially in my group, River. I know your work and I'm so pleased that you're here. Um, we look to you as well and the and all the work that you're doing in Australia. And the idea of pluralism, I think, is absolutely um, the next step. And I didn't include it in this talk today, but you know, we're still talking within legislation. So we even though I talk about the two-hoy legal system, it's still entrapped within a Western piece of legislation. And what I think the future is is not having to need. Western law to recognize it, but for it to be valid in and of itself. And so that would be pluralism, where there are the two, which is what you're talking, um, I acknowledge your work. <laughs> yeah, the two legal systems being able to operate by virtue of their validity um, and being able to be in communication with each other rather than one being on top of the other and this one having to ask permission to be recognized. So I think that's absolutely the future and I'm so grateful that you're here. Uh, nā mihi nui kia koe e te koe. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so uh, Andreas, I tried to promote, but I'm having too much, too hard a time right now getting it done, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I put you in the, into this situation, but you got no, a few it's fine. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, I'm I wondering could, if anyone else has a question. a question. Could I maybe try to ask a question? Please, please, please. <clears throat> Kia ora, Emily. Um, Pamuana did mention that there was already a measure of um, pluralism. I don't know if you heard him talk about that with the, with the church law and the, and the military, the martial law. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah. He was talking about um, his next report um, due out in next March. Um, yeah. So, and and also the, um, the designs for the pluriverse coming out of um, South America, I guess. Um, yeah, well, la, la, la. I don't know how to say it actually when I think about it. Um, so uh, we're in exciting times. We and, are. Um, I'm, I'm really been sort of looking at the commons as an antidote to the colonisation of the highlands of Scotland, which is kind of still happening. Certainly was really in full um, blast around late 1700s um, and then into the early 1800s. And I think it's because of that number three that you mentioned that kind of enforced forgetting and so maybe there are ways that we can unpick that I don't know if you are thinking about ways that we can kind of start with number three and move backwards or do yes, you think we just I, have to hit them all <laughs> <laughs> well I mean those three I agree I, a lot of my work is actually in constitutional transformation and working on Pamwana's uh, Matiki Mai project so I'm excited to hear that that's a kōrero a, a topic that's discussed among you in this space and I would have done a whole nother presentation on that work but absolutely the work right now um, is to rate we call it conscientization um, which is critical theory, I think, word. It's a bit of a mouthful. And it's really about raising the consciousness of people uh, to know what our history is, to understand it, to not get paralyzed with fear or upset, but to recognize that that's happened, to recognize our role, our privilege, our power, and then to action towards transformation. So I feel like the antidote to that number three would be that conscientization. And there's a big movement really starting with an Aotearoa. Then the antidote to number two, which I labeled that uh, violent disconnection, is this work of reconnection that I talk about. And I talk about it being, you know, in a Maori world, us remembering who we are, but on a broader way, all humans remembering who we are, that we're not 
this hierarchical above the earth, separate from her, but we are absolutely off the earth and that the same minerals in our bodies are from the earth. So that reconnection and then that first one, the doctrine of discovery, <laughs> that one is, is really about white, white superiority, you know, European superiority or uh, supremacy. And so that is that is really the birth of, or not the birth of racism, but a, rooted in racism. And so the only way to get rid of that is to get rid of it, <laughs> just get rid of it. So I, I agree that's sort of the action plan, but um, the plurinational constitution that happened in, in uh, Chile is fascinating. And um, yeah, Professor Lisa Longcon and all the effort of their convention, I think is a really exciting example of where we could move to in our countries. Because if we shift at the constitutional level, we stop pruning this Western legal system, stop pruning and trying to make it better, we shift at the root, at the constitution, and we, we shift back to have Papa Tuanuku at the center of the constitution, like in Ecuador or Bolivia, um, and mm. but enforce that, you know? So that would be my, my vision for Aotearoa, is, which would enable pluralistic um, legal systems. Yeah. So, sounds like there's an update to Mataki Mai coming up then, do you think? <laughs> Maybe. I think... I think it's more getting it out there. I mean, the report was published 2016 for those that aren't familiar, Mātike Mai Aotearoa, and um, the work of people on the ground to create the cultural shift that's needed to create to change the constitution is really about um, sharing the dialogue in a peaceful way to raise consciousness and create action, drive towards action, which might end up being political, political will, you know, to, to change our systems. Um, but yeah, you're right, Matiki Mai is the newest rendition of Maori efforts um, to reclaim our sovereignty. Um, Keep going. We have to, Thank we you, have to apologize. Oh, sorry. I just want to apologize because I'm trying to get everyone so they can show their screen and um, in the webinar technology is now I, there's something I'm missing. So I apologize about that. Um, we have I think, Roger. We are, I think we are all here now. That's great. And uh, if we can turn on our videos, um, we can make a nice final screenshot, maybe. Yeah, there's still uh, six attendees that it seems like uh, the webinar has a limit of nine. I can't. Get the other attendees to come over, or maybe they I think have. We're all we're all here, fourteen of us. Okay, I can see all the. Well, it's wonderful. Here. Yeah. Um. At the risk of, uh, can I ask a question? <laughs> of course, <laughs> I love this dialogue. It's great. Yeah. Well, it's two actually, and one of them is more of a comment. Um. Uh, what I what. Uh, I guess, you know, the first, the comments about working within the global footprint of Western law that you were talking about. And I was really excited coming from the United States this past year. Um, there's an instance in Florida where um, a, a pond or a lake in Florida is suing. Um, so, so there's kind of a board or something that's taking on the rights of the lake and there's a lawsuit and I haven't followed it fully, but um, my point here, I guess is, so I come from more of a knowledge commons area. Uh, the area that I study is um, open source software. And for people who don't know that, er that area, uh, there was a brilliant innovation around 1985 where copyright law was hacked, was changed, was utilized to utilize copyright um, to promote sharing. Um, so the, this first uh, license, copyright license is called the uh, General Public License, the GPU. And so, you know, it struck me that, you know, in your case, uh, Matagari, uh, you know, here in 2014, there was a innovative, let's use law um, to, to change the rights of your forest and equivalent in my space here, there, there was this innovation to use copyright law to promote sharing. So I guess I'm just um, energized 
um, because it seems like we're we're seeing human creativity <laughs> to make things happen, working under the constraints of Western law. So that's the comment. Um, the 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 deeper problem a challenge I have coming from where I am in Massachusetts is a colleague of mine who's here on the on the call, Roger. We're part of a group called the Connecticut River Bioregional Collaborative, and um, we're using the term regeneration, um, but it, it's a much, you know, it's an incredibly deep cultural shift that we have to make. And I think it gets back to a couple of the questions that were asked earlier. You know, the challenge of how we get our culture to make a shift toward rethinking the relationship with the earth. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if you have any reactions to that, but that's the big puzzle I have right now. Um, wonderful talk. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, that's the cultural shift. And it's, it's difficult, like for us, we have that living memory of what that means. And we have, we use these terms of whakapapa and um, Fano and whenua, those terms. So in, within our culture, it's easier to, to see the connection. It's in our language. Um, but in a city, you know, where people of settler descent and they're, they're from a worldview that they that would seem so alternative or hippie or whatever it is, there's a lot more work to do. And I, I feel that. Um, but I don't think that's impossible. And I would say that more and more, especially with climate crisis, climate disaster is an example of how the disconnection of humans from the earth has led to this because we, we feel more important. We're in this hierarchy above the earth. We extract for our own convenience. We dispose into for our own convenience because we don't feel that connection of duty. We have property rights rather than responsibilities. Mm. And I think that if we could switch in our law to create responsibilities, or if the law's just over there and you're talking to people, it's really about trying to touch people's um, actual values. What are your actual values? I know we live in a capitalist society. We're very used to transactional. But if you ask people, what is your worldview? They might not have, not have ever been asked that question before. You know, what are your values? How, what do you value? Then that might be the starting place to start really reconnecting because uh, most people want social connection. Most people love trees, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and they, so it's kind of, recognizing that the water we're swimming in this normal is actually extremely damaging and you need to remember that's just one way of doing things it's not the normal objective reality that we have to live in it's our colonized reality and to peel back the cataracts or however you describe it and to see that if we wanted to live in accordance with our values we would be placing the earth at the center and recognizing that relationship and then treating each other accordingly as kin as relationship rather than as consumers or whatever. So it is it is an anti-capitalist movement, really, mm. or a capitalist evolution somehow. Um, but yeah, touching back to values. If you can talk to that, if you, yeah, if you can create dialogue there, that will shift. Yeah. Roger has his hand up. Oh, kia ora, Roger. Hello. Um... Thank you for this. I just kind of riffing off of what you were just talking about. Um, I'm a settler on unceded indigenous land here in the in the Connecticut River Valley, and I'm and and I'd like to get some. It's a big question, but how? What are your experiences dealing working with settlers and trying to develop these partnerships and and relationships? And nice. if you can talk to that a little bit. Yeah, I do do that work. That's a big part of my work because I I see my, I see the work as bridging between the two worlds. Um, there's a couple of thoughts. So the way that you introduce yourself already tells me that you're a safe person to talk to about these things because you recognize the unceded territories and that you are living as a settler upon them. And that, for me, is the first step is accepting that there's that relationship, that there are people of the land and then there are um, not guests, but the word of like, you know, settlers who have come to that land. So that's the first massive step already gone, already done. And then it's about understanding now that privilege and power dynamic 
within whatever impact that you have within your community and being able to, I would say, um, understand that, you know, that's actually the major thing that we struggle with in our society here in Aotearoa with um, our Pākehā friends and relations is understanding that they actually have power by virtue of their position in this colonised reality. It's, the systems are set up for them. So, yeah, and it sounds like you've already done that. So the next thing I would say is live as respectfully as possible with the land. <laughs> and if you're part of this group, I imagine this is part of your life anyway. And if you can, to build relationships with people of the land and to support them in their endeavors. So not to be the leader of any projects that, you know, unless it's within your own community, but to support people with their endeavors to regain and reconnect to their culture. Because if you can be in there as a support, um, then that is the kind of relationship that we're looking for as, as modern Indigenous people. Um, we don't need saving. We don't need people to come in and save it, but we need support and understanding. So if, if we see a safe person that can then go out, can understand us and be part of our conversations and then go out and talk to other settlers who need to hear that message, it's going to be more powerful and safer, actually, for you to share that message then for Indigenous folks to do that. And we've got a lot more work <laughs> that we need to be doing in our own reconnecting of our own people. So that workload, if you get to take on that workload of talking and spreading that message, that's massive. And then coming back for shared, shared kaupapa. So I believe in reconciliation. I believe that we can share this land peacefully, but it has to come after truth. There has to be truth first. And so, um, and that's what I see in Australia too. And the whenua moi moi ya, as we call it, um, there's truth and then there's a truth telling and then there's the reconciliation can come. So thank you for your question, Roger. That's really important work. That thank doing. you. Thanks. Tēnā koe matariki. And I think on that note, um, we will end this webinar. Thank you so much, Matariki, for having agreed to give this talk. I um, really appreciate it and we learned a lot from from all your thoughts and, and ideas that you um, presented. And I pass over to Charlie for a final word. Sure. Uh, Matariki, uh, uh, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Andreas, thank you for setting this up. Um, and thank you to the audience. I see some familiar faces from last year's World Commons Week and from ISC meetings. Thank you all for attending. Um, uh, I know we're all sick of Zoom, I think, <laughs> but this is one instance where uh, I think this technology is wonderful to have this kind of conversation, uh, global conversation, and, and hear these ideas. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's just so important, and I'm very grateful. Um, I'm going to close by just saying, you know, happy World Commons Week. We started yesterday, at least in my time zone, it was yesterday. Um, uh, and what you're seeing now on the screen is we have, we started with a video uh, contest and the three finalists are up there. I encourage people to go there, watch them and, and uh, uh, vote on uh, your favorites. Um, let me just, uh, as we close, point out what's happened, what's happening this week. Um, uh, so we just had this 12 hours ago this morning, um, our African uh, region talk. Uh, as we finish these, for people who weren't able to make the talks, we will make them available soon on the World Commons Week, their website, um, to see. Uh, starting tomorrow, we have Javier um, talking about local and global lessons on aquatic foods, representing the North America region. Um, on the December 8th, the Asia region, we have Eduardo talking about the state of research and collective action on the commons. Uh, on, also on the 8th in China, uh, Yahoo Wang is going to be talking about his uh, commons governance textbook. Um, and that's going to be in Chinese with a uh, live English translation. Um, in Latin America on the 8th, uh, we have these two colleagues who will be talking about defending the commons, tracing roots, pre presence, and futures from Aba Yala, uh, which means Latin America. 
um, in, in Spanish, and we hope we'll have English translation for that. We're still working on that. Um, on the ninth from Europe, Giuseppe, um, you can read his title um, that he'll be giving on the ninth. And then we're going to be closing with, uh, uh, where, where ISC has a really wonderful and energetic early career network. And so we're gonna close the event with two from that network talking about how that network is growing together as an intellectual community. Um, so I think we have a really exciting week ahead. And if you can't make the talks live, they'll be, um, please come back and, and see. And as I close, I just want to remind people that um, every two years, uh, IESC has an, uh, a biennial conference. Um, and this year, it's going to be in Nairobi in June. Um, Madakari, I wish you could come and give your talk there. <laughs> I think a lot of people would, would really get a lot out of it. Um, just a reminder, the close for abstract, so it's a 250-word abstract for uh, talks is closing on December 12th. So there's still time. Um, and I really hope um, I get to meet anyone who uh, on this call that might be there. Um, I'll close with uh, thank you to two of my co-organizers who've been helping me with this event. And I'll leave you with, with this uh, slide. Um, uh, yeah, with the, with the URL. So uh, thank you again, Madakari and Andreas and the community. And I hope whatever time zone you're in, you have a wonderful rest of your day. With that, we'll close. Thank you, bye. Kakite Matariki. Kakite, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everyone.